Sometimes you read that the, the Buddha was a really nice guy. He had some interesting ideas. He didn't push them on anybody. He didn't think that they were necessarily true for anyone else, but they had worked for him and they might work for you. He didn't mean them as absolute truths. But when you actually look at his teachings and the claims he made, that he achieved unexcelled supreme self-awakening. And he had tested it from many angles. The fact that he didn't push his ideas on people didn't mean that he wasn't 100% sure about them. It simply that he realized he was not anyone's creator, he wasn't anyone's father, aside from Rahula. So he's not in a position to make demands on you. But he was sure that if you were sincere in putting his teachings to the test, you would find that they would be true. All he asked was enough conviction that you'd be willing to give them a good test. Here again, there's a lot of misinformation out there, that there's no faith in Buddhism. It's all very rational. But even rational teachings require some faith, require some conviction. In this case, it requires a fair amount. You're going to be sitting here focusing on your breath, restraining yourself from a lot of other things you would rather do. You hold to the precepts again, restraining yourself from things you might want to do. So you have to have some sense, at least, that it's worth it. Conviction comes in here. That's why the Buddha lists it as a strength, and then as a quality that hopes becomes dominant in your mind. Because it asks you to rethink who you are and the world you live in. Then we know what that means. Your sense of who you are in a particular world, that's a state of becoming. So he's asking you to take on a new state of becoming. The world you live in, if you have conviction in the Buddha's awakening, is a world in which someone has gained awakening through his own efforts. And it's articulate enough and observant enough to notice how to teach it to others, and compassionate enough to want to teach it to others. And his compassion was pure. There was no compulsion. There was that story of how, after he gained awakening, he thought about how subtle it was, the realization he, came, he had come to. And he wondered if it would be just a waste of time to try to teach it to anyone else. And the Brahma Sampati read what was going on in his mind and was concerned. Here the Buddha had gone to all this trouble to gain awakening, and he might not share his knowledge. So he came down from his heaven, got down on one knee, and pleaded with the Buddha, Please teach, there are those with little dust in their eyes. They will understand the Dharma. The Buddha surveyed the world with his own knowledge and realized that that was true. So he decided to teach. The commentaries get tied into knots about this story. The idea that the Buddha could even entertain the notion of not teaching others bothered them. But it's tied into the fact that when you gain full awakening, you are totally free of debt, no obligation to anybody. Yet in that state of no obligation, he had the compassion to teach and to go through all that effort, walking all over northern India for forty-five years. setting up the Dharma, teaching the Dharma, establishing the Vinaya, establishing his fourfold bodhisattva, monks, nuns, lay followers, male lay followers, female lay followers. That was a lot of work. So 
So you think about that. Here's someone who's gone to all that effort to show the path to total freedom. We live in a world where that path has been shown. So what does that mean about us? It means that we have the capabilities to follow that path. And if we have any sense of gratitude at all, we should really give ourselves to the path. This requires that we straighten out a lot of things inside, because we have many different identities. A lot of them would rather not be bothered, be perfectly content to live an ordinary life. But then there is that one part of the mind that would like to be free, and it's so stifled by conventional society, conventional values. In fact, there's a large part of society that wants to teach you how to treat it with disrespect. Years back there was a movie, I think it was called The Devils. It was about a priest and a nun, and you saw the first scene. The nun's walking around with her head at a 90-degree angle because she's so warped from lack of having given herself over to natural desires. You could tell where the movie was going. I walked out. Because it seems so unhealthy to treat the idea that the mind that desires purity, the mind that desires a true happiness should be mocked. But it wasn't just that one movie. It's a theme throughout our society, making fun of people who want to keep their virtue pure. Making fun of people who want to find a happiness that doesn't involve sensuality. So the Buddha is saying that if you give respect to the part of the mind that wants genuine happiness, a happiness that's totally harmless, you will benefit. So he's asking you to assume that identity, and then it will require you sorting out all the other identities you have that don't fall in line with that, that feel threatened. And this is what the teaching on not-self is for, to realize that the different identities you have have been gathered from who knows where, lots of different places, lots of different situations. When you observed yourself taking on a particular desire, getting some benefit from it, and sometimes observing accurately and sometimes not accurately. And the fact that the observations were not accurate doesn't mean that that particular sense of self is going to be weak. Sometimes it's the most tenacious. So this will require sorting through your many selves, learning how to disidentify from the ones that really are not in your true best interest. But it's a noble task. That's the other feature of the Buddhist teachings. Is that confers nobility on all the people who practice it. There's the convention of nobility, which is based on birth, based on family inheritance, which is always very questionable. Where do they get all that money? That's not the kind of nobility the Buddha is talking about. It's an ability of a mind who wants to find a happiness that doesn't die and is willing to do what is needed to find it. The truths that in, inform that path are also noble. Someone once asked, what is noble about clinging? What is noble about craving? What's noble about them is that not so much the clinging or the craving, but the attitude that they advise 
one is realizing that your suffering is not caused by anything outside. There may be bad things happening outside, but the fact that the mind is suffering comes from your own actions. So you're taking responsibility and you're learning to step back from the very things that you cling to and that you hold on to and say, I need to comprehend these so I'd have no more passion for them. That's what's noble about that truth. The same with it. The second noble truth. You step back from your craving, you realize, I have to abandon this. Craving for sensuality, the fascination with thinking about and planning sensual pleasures, craving for becoming, taking on more identities, craving for non-becoming, craving to destroy any identities you have that you don't like. The fact that you're willing to step back and abandon them. That's what's noble about that truth. So this is the becoming that the Buddha has you assume as you take on the practice. That you live in a world where awakening is possible, true happiness is possible, release is possible. And you live in a world where you can become noble. Think about the Ajans in the forest tradition. Most of them were born into peasant homes. And someone looking from outside might say, where are these people going to find nobility? They might say, well, the fact that they would put up with their sufferings stoically, that's noble. But they just didn't put up with their sufferings. They realized they lived in a world where it was possible to find the way out. And they made the sacrifices that were needed. So when the Buddha asks that you have conviction in his awakening, that's what he's asking. That you assume that you live in a world where true freedom is possible. And you, through your efforts, can find it. And you'll be ennobled in the process. Those are good assumptions to make. And all he asks is you take them on as working hypotheses. You don't have to swear on a stack of Bibles that you believe. Simply look at your actions and see where they're causing harm, and figure out how not to cause that harm. That's all that's asked.